Good to see everybody this morning. If we'll turn your Bibles over to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, you remember the uh, movie, it comes on, I, I'm not sure if it's Turner or who it is, but they show it kind of 24 hours of the Christmas story, you know, the one I'm talking about, the Christmas story. I uh, remember that the main character is a little blonde-headed, blue-eyed boy by the name of Ralphie, and uh, Ralphie had a favorite radio station he liked to listen to. At that time, boys and girls didn't have a TV, and had a radio, and uh, the shows came in over the radio, and that's how they entertained themselves. And one of the little shows that would come on, that was his favorite show, if you remember, was the Little Offer Nanny show. Remember Little Offer Nanny? She is in the books as well. Somebody asked about, you know, her. She's red-headed, curly eye, and has no eyeballs, you know, if you want to talk about. Okay, well, I had a radio show, and, and at the end of the show, they would have a secret message that went out only to Annie's secret inner circle. And Ralphie longed to be a part and to be in the Annie's Inner Secret Circle Club. And he used to just dream about all the adventures and the antics and the escapades that would happen. And he could just get in that club and he could decode those secret messages. You know, at the, the end they would have, of course, 9, 10, 11 year old kids that got just numbers. And, and uh, so he finally worked and got enough uh, of the, the box tops that you had to have to send in to get the decoder. You had to have a decoder. And at the end, uh, he would say, now here is a special message, a special code for all you who are a member of Annie's secret inner circle. And so he got his decoder and uh, he had this uh, little letter that congratulated him and tell him how that he was now in and he got all of the rights and the privileges of a member of Annie's secret inner circle club. And he listens very attentively and he writes down all the code and he rushes on with great expectations that he is going to be able to decode this and it's going to be something great because at the end it would say, always remember boys and girls, Annie wants you to decode this message. She is depending on you. Now, you know, to a 9 or 10 year old, that's important. And so he gets his decoder and he starts decoding, you know, and it says uh, uh, R, uh, then E. M, E, R, and on and on and on. And finally, when he gets to the end of it, he looks at it and it says, Remember to drink your Ovaltine. Ovaltine? And then remember, Ovaltine was a, you know, a drink like next to quick. And that was the sponsor of the program. And so he leaves the room sorely disappointed. And that what he thought, if he could just get in, it was going to bring so much happiness. You know, there's a lot of people today who think that if I could just be in this or that, that I could be so happy. But I'm going to tell you, as we begin our series this morning on identity in Christ, knowing my identity, and today we're going to talk about being complete in Christ, the word phrase in Christ and in Him is so vital and so very important. If you look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, if you got, got your Bibles, hold them up. Got your Bible with you? Great. All right. Look over here in Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And look at that last phrase, in Christ. In Christ. Now, if you go on and you read this entire chapter, you look down in verse 6, you find that uh, He has uh, bestowed His grace on us in, in the beloved. In verse 7, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in Him. Go on down to verse 11, we have obtained an inheritance. We're the inheritance of God in Christ. In chapter 2, the very same thing. You just continue to read chapter two, well, chapter 1, verse 13, chapter 2, verse 6. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 says that God has given us power in all things that pertain to life and God is in Christ. And we need to understand that it's in Him because you see, in myself I am nothing, but in Christ there is a big difference. And this morning we're going to talk a little bit about being in Christ and how that we to get into Now, how do you get into Christ? Well, Galatians 3 and verse 27 says, For as many of you has been baptized, into Christ have put on Christ. 
Now notice what he says here. We're baptized into Christ. But the thing about it is there's a lot of us that have been baptized into Christ, but yet we don't know why we've been baptized into Christ. It's because of the way that we think about it. You see, we think that we're in ourselves, but there's a big difference in being in and of yourself because in and of yourself, what can you do? Nothing. But in Christ, Paul said in Ephesians 1 3, all special blessings are there. All things that pertain to life and godliness are there. That being in Christ. And this morning, that's what we need to know. If you're not in Christ this morning, then the thing that you need to do is to get into Christ. How do I get into Christ? Well, according to Galatians 3 27, I am baptized into Christ. But then I may be set in Christ, but I've got to believe that, and I've got to know what God says that that means that I am in Christ. And uh, I don't think anybody can uh, ever have victory. You can never experience victory until you realize that you are in Christ. Because there's too much stuff of the world and too much... See, there's folks sitting here this morning that are going, well, I just don't think that's right. See, that there it is. It's okay. The soul. You're thinking again. You overthink. I just don't think that will work. Well, that closes the door on God. There's another group sitting here saying, oh, when are you going to get to the point that you just tell me what I need to do? See, that's the flesh talking right there. You know, it, it, he's already given us ten commandments, and we couldn't keep them. Do you think giving us another commandment is going to help? <laughs> it's not going to help. We can't keep the ones he's given us. So giving me you another commandment is not, it's my mindset. I've got to remember, I am in Christ. And I do not experience victory in this world until I realize that all things pertaining to life and God, all spiritual blessings are in Christ. And it's not me. You know, there's a, a, a verse of Scripture over in uh, Colossians, if you will, turn with me to Colossians 2, and look in verse 10. Notice that he says, And in Him, that is Christ, you have been made complete. The King James Version says, You have been made full. You have been in Him, you have been made full. You have been made complete. Now, when you think about being complete, and, and so I decided, well... Let me kind of expand this a little bit and, and look at what this word means. Are you complete in Christ or incomplete? You're, you're complete in Christ. You have been made full. What does the word complete mean? And so I went to the lexicon and began to look at how this word is translated in the Greek uh, New Testament. And uh, the word complete means satisfied, finished, perfected. Filled up. How many of us this morning are not satisfied or running on empty tanks? Assured. In other words, confident. You see, it, you know, you can sit around in the boat all that you want to with the natural man. You know, you can sit there, but if you want to be like Peter, you go, if you want to get out and walk on the water, then what do you got to do? You got to be confident. Well, in Christ, there is confidence. You see, there's a lot of people this morning that I have great ideas, but they'll never be able to do those ideas once they don't have confidence. There's a lot of people who can live a victorious life for the Lord, but they're not going to get out of the boat. They're not going to go to Jesus. Why? They're not going to live in the supernatural. They're going to stay in the boat and stay in the natural and the flesh. And the word there, to be complete in Christ, to be filled with Christ, means to be assured, to be secured, knowing who you are. Are. There's the key. Knowing who I am. Now, complete means this. Incomplete means not satisfied, but dissatisfied. Not filled, but empty. Not secure, but insecure. How many people do you know who are working with insecurities? And they go through life being pushed through life with insecurities. And when I say insecurities, they're sitting there saying to themselves, what in the world is wrong with me? <coughs> What is wrong with me? Why, why am I so different from other folks? Isn't that right? Now, let me give you kind of an example of that. There are some folks that once they get grown and they haven't gotten married and they begin to get up into their 20s and maybe broke their 30s or a little bit older, and they begin to go, well, what is wrong with me? You say, I, I can't ever be complete until I get married. Well, that's not true. That's not true, but there's a lot of folks who feel 
that. There's a lot of folks who say, what is wrong with me? Because uh, I, I'm not like everybody else. I, there, there are folks who say they don't feel complete unless they have a certain degree of education. They're not they're going to be complete unless they have a particular job or they climb so high on the corporate ladder. And they go through life questioning, well, what is wrong with me? See, that's insecurity right there. But in Christ, I'm secure. Now, I may not be as smart as, and we talked about this in Bible study, I may not be as smart or as talented as somebody else, but remember, God creates all of us different for a reason. Some of us, He wants to be doctors, and some of us, He wants to be ditch diggers. I mean, you got to have ditches, just like you got to have a medical profession. And so there's nothing wrong with that. And God doesn't see any distinction in people. As Paul is later going to say in Colossians, for there is no distinction between male and female, bond and free, Jew and Gentile, ditch digger and doctor. God doesn't look at that stuff. Why? Because we're all the same in Christ Jesus. And so this morning, if you want to get rid of your insecurities, think about the fact that you're in Christ, and that's good enough. That's good enough. You're in Christ. Now, you can, of course, do other things, but, but that's all right. Uh, you will... Uh, I, I just wonder sometimes if we really... How wonderful it is whenever we can honestly take an evaluation of ourselves and not feel put down. You know, you look at yourself and you think, well, I'm not this and I'm not that, and I can't do this and I can't do that. What's wrong with me? But in Christ, hey, I may not be able to lead singing, but hey, that's okay. I may not be able to stand up and preach or to teach. Hey, that's okay. There are things that you can do that I can't do, and God designed it that way. I have people all the time apologizing to me because they can't teach or they can't do this or do that. But yet they spend more time doing the work of the Lord in the area they can do than those folks who can do those other things. So don't put yourself down. Don't put yourself down. Experience victory not in what you are. And we live in a society where we are pretty well connected to who we are is valued by what we do. And the problem is what we do has got a thing to do with God's love. What did you do to earn God's love? Nothing. Okay. That's not it. And you can't be good enough. You can't. See, the flesh will say, okay, all right, you weren't good enough today, so tomorrow you've got to be twice as good if you're going to get this love. And the problem is, well, you couldn't be good enough over here. Why do you compound it and think that you'd be good enough twice as good enough and get God's love? See, that's Satan trying to talk to you and talk you out of being in Christ and the power and the rights and the privileges of being in Christ. There's a Christian writer by the name of, of uh, uh, Chris Kane. She is Australian. And she has a lot of really good things to say about identity in Christ. I've seen her material down through the years. And let me tell you a little bit about Chris. Whenever Chris was 32 years old, she got a call one night from her brother. Her brother says, Chris, I, I just got something in the mail. Uh, it says something about me being adopted. Oh, you're not adopted. You're not adopted. We're going to be over at Mom's tomorrow night for supper, so if you just come on over and bring that letter, and we'll, we'll look at that. So they got over to the house and talking with her mother, and uh, then the, the brother John brings out that letter that says something about his adoption, and uh, the mother's face just all the color grains out, and she says, well, the truth of the matter, John, is uh, uh, you were adopted. And Chris says, well, you know, praise the Lord that uh, the truth has come out in this matter. You know, it's kind of interesting, isn't it, that we can always praise the Lord when somebody else's problem. But the mother looked at Chris and says, well, Chris, since we're getting the truth out, maybe we need to get all the truth out. You're adopted, too. <laughs> Boy, you talk about a body blow. I mean, that right there would knock the wind right out of you to think about me. I've gone all these years and and I'm adopted. Somebody gave me up. <laughs> and she says, the first thing that came to my mind, now let me share with you, go with me to the Psalms, Psalms 139, and I want you to listen. 
she says, this is what God said that got me through this crisis. Look at verse 13 for you. This is Psalms 139, verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. And she said another verse that came to mind was Jeremiah 1, verse 3, where God comes to Jeremiah and says, Jeremiah, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. She says, God has formed me, God knows me in my mother's womb. And I guess according to these documents, who's there womb that was? It doesn't matter. And she was able to over overcome that because she listened to what God said. God said, I, I knew you. I formed you. You go on and you read this verse. You Verses here, you'll see that, that David talks about the omniscience and the omnipresence of God, and that when we were just little bitty tiny cells, and then later on, you know, we were just a little bit bigger and maybe weighed an ounce, but yet there was a heart there, and there were kidneys there, and there were lungs there, and there were all these little parts. And, and he says that you have created me. He talks about creating my bones and creating my inward parts. But in all that is it is all those parts and, and you know the secret of that and it's the mystery of that. And so she got one day about a year or two later she decided well I'll, I'll find my uh, birth mother. And so she goes and she works and finally she finds her birth mother which this lived not too many miles away but you know her birth mother didn't want to have anything to do with her. Didn't want to have anything to do with her. And so in the process of this, she found her birth certificate, the original birth certificate. And up at the top of the birth certificate, you know where it'll have name and all this stuff for the baby? It said, unnamed and unwanted. Now you talk about another body blow, unnamed and unwanted. And she says, I, I got back into the, the scriptures and started studying again. And in the 27th Psalm, David said, For my father and my mother have forsaken me. <clears throat> the Lord will take me. She says, Now, before I was born, I don't even know who my mom is, but God knows me. God born me. I found my mama. She didn't want me then. She don't want me now. As a matter of fact, she put unnamed and un uh, unwanted on the birth certificate. But God placed me in a loving, kind home. That even if my mother and father forsake me, I'm not going to forsake you. You see, you got to get into the mind of God. You got to get into the agreement with God. What God says about things. What God says about you. That's what matters. Over in uh, uh, Colossians, you know, we were talking there in Colossians about being uh, in, uh, in Him. Uh, and, and He talks about the fact that, look, I'm not going to forsake you. I, some people think that, well, you know, I'm nothing. And we beat ourselves up and we run ourselves down. But we talk about, I'm just trash. I'm garbage. I'm worthless. Well, no, that's what Satan wants you to believe. That's what Satan to tell you. But if you go to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, he says, For if you're in Christ, you are a new creature. Behold, all things become new. You know that old trash, that old garbage, that old worthless? In Christ becomes new. It becomes new. But you see, for this to work, I've got to get in agreement with God. I've got to believe and say, God, you know what you said about me is right. And I'm not going to let my circumstances around me dictate it. I'm not going to let my feelings around me dictate it. I'm not going to let what others say around me dictate. I am going to stay in agreement with you. Now, how do we stay in agreement with God? Let me give you some keys. Some keys real quick. Our time is just about it. You know, if you stay in agreement with God... You're not going to let the devil destroy and run out of you what Christ died for you to have. 
And there's three things you've got to do. Number one, to stay in agreement with, with God, with, with God on these matters, knowing who I am in Christ, I've got to believe what God says about me. Start believing. Stop believing Satan. See, Satan's your enemy, but so many times we listen to the enemy rather than listening to God. In the Bible, this is the mind of God right here. Get into His mind. Allow His mind to be your mind. And you can have victory. And then, number two, not only do you have victory, but notice in Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 2, he says, Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on earth. The Amplified Version says, Set your mind and keep them set on things that are above. You know what Christians are to be? We're to be made up people. We have already made up our minds. We're to set our mind and we're to keep our mindset. That's what we need this morning. We need to make up our minds. Are you a made up minded person? I've already made up my mind. Before my feet hit the floor every morning, I allow my bed to become an altar of God. And I pray to Him and I rehearse the goodness that God has done for me and I rehearse what that means for me to be in Christ and then my feet hit the floor. And circumstances and Satan and self are not going to lie to me today. I have set my mind and I am going to keep it set. Years ago, there was an old black and white movie. It was one of my favorite movies about a, a plane of World War II that was flying a, a mission and on the way home over the Mediterranean. Uh, the navigator had uh, missed the navigation because he had not factored in a tailwind and the plane crashed and it did not crash. They had taken the water survival gear with them when they bailed out. But because of his lack of navigating correctly, they bailed out over the desert. Well, rubber rafts don't help you much in deserts. And you see, life, you're going through that course of life, and there's going to be these winds that are blowing on you, and they're going to want to get you off course. But like a good spiritual navigator, you go back to the gyroscope. Here's the gyroscope right here. It'll get you back on the course. You see, it's correcting the course. I'm not telling you, of course, it's still going to show. There are going to be storms, headwinds, tailwinds. There's going to be crosswinds. There's going to be all kinds of things that come. But right here is your course. Make up your mind and keep it made up that I am going to serve God, that there's wonderful blessings in Christ Jesus, and where the mind goes, the man will fall. See, if I correct my thinking, the body will fall. And then number three, this is one that I really get excited about. Learn how to lean on God. This morning, some of us may be saying, man, I, I don't know. I'm afraid he'll go fall. Go with me to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, the story of Cain and Abel. You remember that Cain rose up and killed Abel because God accepted Abel's sacrifice. He did not accept Cain's sacrifice. And we pretty well match the story. But like Paul Harvey, let me give you the rest of the story this morning. Now over here in chapter 4 of Genesis, we have the, the, the lesson. And of course, God now comes... Cain in verse 9, and, and he says, Where is Abel, your brother? And now notice, God, Cain is going to get smart with God. You ever have anybody get smart with you? He said, Well, how do I know? I don't, I don't know. I'm not my brother's keeper. You're asking the wrong person. How, how would I know? And uh, he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed on the ground, which has opened his mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagabond and a wanderer on the earth. Now, a lot of people think that God cursed Cain. He didn't curse Cain. Cain cursed himself. 
if you look in the Hebrew, I mean, boys and girls, this is why you need to go to school. And you need to learn to read and understand and comprehend. This language, whenever Moses penned it in Hebrew, it was penned in the third person, the indicative mood, which means God said, Cain, you did this to yourself. Now, they lived in a time when people were living six, seven, eight hundred years. And just uh, how many funerals do you think Cain had attended? Probably none. But yet now Cain finds himself a murderer. And he says, you know, when people see what I have done, they're going to want to kill me also. And God says, that's right, Cain, you've done this to yourself. You have shed blood. That blood is crying from the ground. And isn't it kind of interesting that he, that God speaks of the principle that Paul talks about over in Galatians chapter 6 when he says that whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. See, all these principles, they, they've been with God all along. These are not new ideas. And so Cain, here he is. He, he has killed his brother. God says, you have brought this on yourself. Your, your curse is because of what you have done. And Cain says, my punishment, in verse 13, is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I will be hidden, and I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. And notice this next, verse, uh, next phrase. And whoever finds me will kill me. When they find out that I killed Abel, they're going to kill me too. God says, you're right. Now, Cain, you brought this on yourself. Notice that Cain, though, cries out to God. Let's keep reading. Verse 15. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain, said no one finding him would slay him. Our U.S. Marshal Services has a program in which a criminal can turn state's evidence and they hide them away. And the law can't touch them. And the criminals that they have told them about can't touch them. It's called the witness protection program. Now that program didn't start Marshals. What did he say? I'll put a mark on you that no man can touch you. Cain, you're going to enter into my witness protection program. You've told them you said. And Satan's not going to be able to get at you, nobody else is going to get at you either. Now there's two things we, we got to talk about. Number one, God didn't put you in that ditch. He didn't put you there. That's why he told Cain. He said, Cain, this situation, you put yourself there. Have you noticed that here's Cain who was a murderer, but God's still talking to him? God's still talking to him. Lord, if he would have ever thought that God would have talked to a murderer, he's still talking to him. God would never want to have communion with me and relationship with me and fellowship with me because look at all the things that I've done. Who's that talking? God or Satan? And Satan. Cain killed his brother. God's still talking to him. Whenever Cain finally reckons what he has done and comes to an agreement with God on what he has done and the punishment that's going to happen to him, God says, well, I'll put you in witness protection. See, number one, God didn't put us in the ditch, but number two, God will get down in that ditch and help us to get out of it. Isn't that one? He'll help us to get out of the ditch. He'll keep on. This morning, don't listen to Satan. Maybe you need to be baptized into Christ. And I hope this morning that God's Word will encourage you that all spiritual blessings are in Won't you come? <coughs> Thank you.